Green Thumbs, it's Tanisha Spain, host of Mid-American Gardener, and thanks so much for joining us for another show today. We've got a lot to cover, um, and if you're anything like me, this warmer weather is making it very antsy and wanting to get outside. So we've got our panelists here to discuss just that. You remember last week, we talked about uh, not disturbing some of our beneficial pollinators and starting seeds. And so continuing with that discussion, we're going to talk about planning, scheduling, what goes where, and uh, learn a little bit more about the next step that we'll be taking in the next few weeks. So I'll stop talking and have our panelists introduce themselves and tell you about where you can find them in the garden. So Karen, we'll start with you first. Hi, I'm Karen Ruckel, and I'm a gardener in the Peoria area, and I love perennials and shrubs and um, just house plants in general. All right, wonderful. Uh, Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jennifer Nelson. I'm a horticulturalist and you can find me online at groundedandgrowing.com. My favorite things are really anything plant related, but if I had to pick, it would be vegetable gardening, uh, orchids and house plants in general. Awesome. Okay. Nice cross section of talent here. So uh, show and tells are always what we start with. So Karen, uh, what did you bring for us today? Well, in talking about things in the garden, I'm trying to get a few things done before some heavy rains come or potentially come. And so I'm having to dig out a tree that um, unfortunately due to bore damage, die back, it, it's got to go. But underneath it, I've got Virginia bluebells that are coming up. And so right now out in the garden, how easy it'll be to see this, but they're just barely peeking out of the ground. They're just little purple, purple um, starts. And I had to dig it out or I would have trampled them. But I've never dug up Virginia bluebells because they're a long lived perennial that you just leave alone. I was just really interesting. Of course, I chopped right through the, the, the whole root structure, but it was really interesting how thick and gnarly the root system was on this Virginia bluebell. And, you know, they, they come up in spring, they flower, they're so pretty, and then they die back in midsummer. And, and so I just really didn't even think about how much structure was under the ground. And uh, so it was kind of fascinating um, chopping it apart and seeing uh, how their root structure is. So what's next for that hunk? Well, I think I'm going to have to give a lot of it away and um, then I'll replant some of it. Um, some of it I might, I've already put some into pots to hold because now I've got to wait to find a new selection of a small tree or something to put back into this garden bed. And then I'll put my perennials back around in that area by that new, new selection. Awesome. Thank you, Karen. And John? I am so sorry. I forgot to have you introduce yourself. <laughs> I almost left. <laughs> no. My apologies. So you're up next. Uh, go ahead and okay. tell us your name and where we can find you, and then we'll ask you a question. Okay. I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener, and I like a lot of different things I'm into. My new newest thing is um, greenhouse, and also I started to teach... Uh, um, a little bit of straw bale gardening. So uh, this is at Schlarman uh, High School here in Danville. And uh, I, I, my, probably my favorite plant though is still hostas. Yes, I was blown away when I first met you and found that you had hundreds of them in your yard, different varieties. Uh, so yes, I would say you are the guy when it comes to hostas in the area. So the question for you, John, is this came in on our Facebook. Um, this is from Hallie Besner and it says, what kind of soil should I use to replant or repot a fern um, that's been in the same pot all winter? It's starting to look kind of tired. And so she's wanting to freshen this up. So what, what do you recommend for repots? Okay, this is one I just brought from the green. It was, a, it must've been, it must've been subliminal because this is one that has not been repotted yet. And we are, are in the process of repotting them and not only repotting them, but if you, when you take that out of the pot, you're gonna find that it's so root bound. And so what I'm taking is my reciprocating saw, or you could take a handsaw and cutting them in fourths or in sixths. And that way you get six plants or four plants out of that one. Um, and you may have to trim the underneath of it also just to get it down into the ground where you want it so that the, the uh, you can put the correct soil. As far as the correct soil, 
you want to use a very good potting soil, something that is a good mix. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the one that I use is, you know, it's a miracle in, in the bag, so to speak. I won't say the name, but um, there's- <laughs> We're going to get a million emails now. We have to know what that is John was talking about. <laughs> but there are, there are three different types that I like for, for a plastic pot. I would just go with the, the yellow bag. There is a blue bag that has some water retaining crystals in it that is nice, especially if you're using a, a fiber pot or something like that, or a, uh, a, a tile pot. Um, but this is a plastic pot. They tend to hold the moisture a little bit better. But if you're one of those that doesn't like the water, then the blue bag might be a little bit better because it does have those water retaining crystals. So like I said, We've done, we've been over the last couple of weeks, we've been dividing these and I think we're up to 80 now that we've divided. And <clears throat> they're really starting to look very nice. This is a repotted one and it's mm -hmm. almost gotten to be as big as the one that, but it's so much fresher. And uh, one of the other things uh, that the potting soil should have is some long acting fertilizer. And if it doesn't, I would still use a long acting fertilizer to incorporate into the soil because um, anytime you put in pots and you're watering them, that water um, leaches through and, and takes all the nutrients out of that soil. So, but the potting soil is so important that you're not getting, you know, I wouldn't go down to the garden and get, you know, you're gonna have weeds and, and you might have diseases in that where this is basically a soilless mix and it, it just works so nice for pots. Okay, so I, and that's another segment we could do another time, John, is uh, people get a little gun shy, present company included, when it's time to cut, right? I have a, a couple of plants. My ZZ is like, there are little lumps and bumps showing on the outside of the pot, but when people talk about getting a saw or getting something and cutting the roots, um, that is very nerve wracking. So perhaps that's something we can visit you and uh, learn a little bit more about so that we can all be a little bit more brave when it's actually time. To yeah, if, if you're kind of squeamish, a handsaw works pretty good because you can kind of, I use my reciprocate, a battery operated reciprocating saw with a long blade and I just zoomed and, and I, I, I usually don't let the kids take the saw. Uh, they get the handsaw, but I get the electric saw. Okay. And, uh, but they're doing they're they've learned and they're, I don't even have to tell them now. I just say, mm -hmm. go repot this and, and they're doing a wonderful job. So after a couple, it just is easy. Just another skill under your belt. Gotcha. Okay. All right, Jen, we're on to you. Okay. Well, I brought kind of an early spring house plant uh, for March. Um, this is a oxalis. Um, some people would call it a shamrock. Um, this particular one has lavender flowers. Um, but I wanted to point out to people that this um, can be planted as a container plant outside. Um, I've done some summer containers where you actually order their, their little tiny cones. They look like uh, pine cones and, the, and they don't get planted very deeply. But some two things that will make you think that you've killed this plant when you have actually not killed it at all. Um, at night, the, it gets droopy the leaves kind of fold around themselves. And, and the first time I saw it happen, I thought I killed it within 24 hours of purchasing it. Um, and it, I looked up the uh, vocabulary word for it, for those of you that are into, the, into that, knowing the botanical term, it's called photo nasty. Hmm. So that, yeah, there's a, there's a fun 25 cent word to drop uh, around your friends and impress them. But this will all, these will also go dormant. And that's the other part later on in the season where you think you killed it. Um, after the temperatures get good and warm above 80 degrees, it'll start to look droopy all the time. And that's a good signal to just stop watering and let it dry, dry up and all the, the greenery will die off. And then just put it in a decent window inside and give it a little bit of water now and then and watch for regrowth. It'll eventually start growing again and then you can give it more water. Uh, but um, they're really fun. They're not just for St. Patrick's Day. I've got a purple one, um, two purple ones, actually. One of them ended up getting diseased. And so I cut it all the way back, put it in the infirmary, you know, and 
I mean, it, it's funny how quickly they grow back. The flat, it sent a flower up first and then the foliage started to come back. Um, I didn't know that you could leave them outside. I just always imagined them as a house plant. So. Well, not all the time. You can't leave them out, out all the time, um, but that you could put them like in a container as an animal outside. I wouldn't leave them over the winter. Gotcha, noted. Okay, thank you. All right, Karen, I think we're back around to you now. Well, I was I was also going to talk a little bit about a house plant, and we just we just came off of um, what over two two and a half three weeks where we had pretty severe cold weather, and so all of our furnaces were were working pretty hard, and and that dried out the air, and so I wanted to mention that this is a good time to be checking all your house plants. I've got a calathea, and it. I, I honestly, I was getting ready for vacation, so I wasn't really paying attention, but it was drooping. And I thought, oh, it must be a little dry. And so I just threw water on it and walked away. And a couple of days later, I'm like, oh, you're still droopy. And this plant, it was actually spider mites that was causing the droopiness on the leaves. And it, it still has a lot of damage on the old leaves, um, but it's, it's not drooping anymore. It's, it's standing up a little bit more erect. The problem with spider mites is that they're, they're easy or bad thing. They're easy to kill, but they're quick to come back. So I've already sprayed this twice with just an insecticidal soap. And then I made sure I got the tops and the bottoms of all the leaves. And then I've done it again. And I'll probably do it again before I put it near other plants, just to be on the safe side that I've cleared all of them off. So Karen, when you found, um, when you found them, this, I'm assuming, when you went back and after you watered it and realized, okay, you're still not looking great, did you look on leaves? You know, how did you discover that it was, in fact, spider mites? Yes, I, I looked on the bottom side of the leaves, and a lot of times it's it's kind of a sandy look, or a not quite right look, sandiness on the bottom of the leaves, and then I got my handy-dandy uh, phone and used the uh, magnifier on the phone and quickly was able to see uh, the spider mites. Gotcha. That's great advice because a lot of people, you know, we think, okay, you need water, pour it on, it doesn't work. Um, so what's the next step? So I always appreciate what someone else's detective skills look like when I'm trying to diagnose what we've got going on over here. Okay. John, did you have another show and tell or did you want to do a question from uh, our viewers? Um, no, I, I didn't. That's I only had the ferns. So okay, all right. So let's. So uh, this weekend, I posted on our Facebook and just asked folks. You know, as we move into um, creating our visions, creating our dream garden, our dream beds, um, what are some questions that you have, and what are some things that you've run into, and what's worked, and what hasn't worked? So um, a couple of things. We had a couple of really big questions that I think we could boil down and, and help folks get some answers to. So Barbara Bundy writes in, uh, this is question number 16. Last year was all about the flower beds at my house. Now we're onto the turf. I'm in Aurora. The area is Western exposure with dappled sun. What seed do you recommend and when should I plant it? So John, you pointed out right away, now that we're talking about turf, this sort of, uh, not limits, but there are, are things to consider, you know, off the jump. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the, 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 you, uh, the main thing I've, I have read and, and under my experience is you don't want just one type of seed. You want to get, I, I usually use a, a mix of three, um, mainly because they, one may thrive under real hot sun. Another one does better when it's a little bit wetter. One does better when it's really, really dry. It's, the other two may fade. So you always have one that looks pretty green in your yard. You're, you know, when you walk really close, you probably see some, some damage and, and maybe not looking real good, but at least it's green. So there's three, three main grasses. You have your perennial rye grass, your uh, uh, tall fescue, and then you have your um, uh, Kentucky bluegrass. So um, you want to mix. And, and I would go to a, uh, a garden setter and get a good quality mix. Again, you want that, that, that perennial rye grass, the uh, tall fes or red fescue, and the um, Kentucky bluegrass. You want those three or, or at least types of those three. There's, and there's lots of variances in those three. Uh, 
go to a local go, a vendor because what's up in Aurora, maybe you're going to be a little bit cooler up there than down here. Or somebody down in Carbondale is going to be, you know, we're going to vary quite a bit because we've got uh, almost three zones there that we're working in. And so um, I would I would go to a, a good quality uh, vendor and garden center and find out exactly what grasses of each of those type they would recommend. But I would want at least three different varieties. Okay. All right, great. Um, next question, and this is just kind of for anybody, and then we're going to spend the last few minutes talking about uh, planning out our gardens. But this is from uh, Diane O'Connor, and she says, is there a general guide or something out there uh, with a timeline that you know uh, how to follow your seedlings um, all the way from planting until blooming. And so uh, what is, what, <laughs> through trial and error, I guess, uh, and Karen, Jennifer, jump in anywhere. Uh, what do you suggest there? Okay, I, I'll be honest. I read that question and I said, there's just so much in that question. But number one rule of thumb is consult your seed packet and know when your date of last frost is in your area. Because if you know that, like here in Central Illinois, we figure around Mother's Day or May 15th is approximately the last frost, you can count backwards and figure out approximately when to do that planting and whether you're going to do it inside or whatever. Um, but it will say on the back of the packet, generally speaking, how long it will take and you can plant from there. And there's always going to be weather issues that come up that will delay or otherwise Get in the way of its, you know, don't call me because it didn't adhere to exactly what that seed packet said. I've had people say that over the years, like, well, you said the last frost date was May 15th and, you know, it wasn't. And, well, that's all a general guide. So yeah. keep that in mind. Okay. And Karen, um, you know, you are, you're in Tazewell County. Is that where you are? Am I right? Uh, Woodford. Woodford. Okay. So is there anything to say um, sweeping changes. John mentioned that we, you know, our, our show covers so many growing zones. Is there a big difference between let's say 5A, 5B, something that we would need to do differently than folks in another area in your experience? Not really. It's just that the, the fun starts a little earlier in the Champagne area than, than for me. But um, <laughs> I, I would say it, it, it just runs maybe a week behind Okay. okay, too bad. It's not like big sweeping differences. So, but that is like an eternity when you just want to get out there. So, um, all right, so we've got about eight minutes left. Um, and I just kind of want to open this up to general discussion for folks. You know, let's say you've got this plot of, of ground, um, but what are some things that newer folks may not think of? We had another question that we can tackle another time about rotating crops and uh, what sort of things to do there. So I kind of just want to turn it over to open discussion. John, I know you've got some notes, but what are some great, you know, rules of thumb in eight minutes or less uh, that we can give people as they're starting out this design process? So um, John, you kick it off because you're kind of prepared for, for this discussion. So where, you know, what are some good rules of thumb here? Okay, first of all, you have to decide <clears throat> what kind of garden you want to grow. Is it a vegetable garden or a flower garden? Sun hours are it's going to be an important part of where you place this garden. Um, uh, and another thing is, where's the, well, how, how are you going to water? Where's, where's the closest spigot? If you're way at the other end of your yard and you have to run a hose every time, you're not probably going to do it every, as often as you need. So, uh, and, and then how big? Uh, we always, I think, think too small. Because we're always, we go to the nursery and we come home with about 20 more plants than what we need for in that small space. So, so Jennifer's laughing. So I think she's done this before. <laughs> so, what's, okay. what's shape? You know, I've, I'm doing a presentation on hummingbirds and I found that kind of a sweeping you or, or, or an angled garden is better because your birds and, and just even you can get more visual effect from your from from the from your flower beds, uh, and and then if you're doing vegetables, it's not too bad to put some flowers in there because you're going to draw the pollinators in there, and and then you're going to have better better fruit. 
Are you going to have a, are you, maybe you're just going to do a container. So you're going to need to make sure that that container is in, in sun. And you're also going to need to make sure that that is big enough for what you're wanting to grow. Uh, tall plants on the north side, usually native or non-native, uh, they both have their, their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, you want to kind of, if you're making a, a garden, you want to have color for all seasons. So uh, there's, there's, there's Let's so, go back so to many. the height part. Um, Cause I, we touched on that. Uh, I think a little bit before the show, um, Jen or, or Karen, can you give us an example of being mindful of the planting height or the mature plants height or, you know, some good information there? Um, pay attention to the label, no matter how much you want to, no matter how much you want to put a certain plant in a certain area, um, it's not going to, it's not going to necessarily follow the label completely. I've had stuff where it says it's only, you know, going to be three feet high and it's five feet high because you've got it in this great, perfect location and it's doing better than the label says it will. But more often than that, I, I have learned over the years that I need, I really do need to measure stuff. I am completely the do as I say, not as I do gardener, horticulturalist. I have made every mistake in the book and um, cramming plants into an area because you just really want to see it there. It doesn't create you some problems later on. And Karen, as a nursery employee, when you, what's the most common thing, well, maybe annoying thing that, that gardeners overlook and then they come back in and they're freaked out about um, when they're just starting out? I think it's really that initial taking care of a plant um, because within that first month, a plant potentially needs a little bit more attention with watering and watching with, with the weather. Cause you get, you get a couple days of really windy days and, and the temperature spikes like we're having right now and, and things can dry out and, you can kill a plant pretty quickly by drying it out. So I, I think that's the biggest thing is, is when you do plant something, pay attention to it, visit it every couple of days. I always make fun of people that they came in and they didn't even know the name of the plant. I'm like, you had it over and you didn't even learn its name. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just be mindful that at the beginning, just kind of visit it from, from a couple of times a, a week and then you'll see what it needs or doesn't need. And then once it roots in, you can start ignoring it. Gotcha. Be neglectful later, right? Let it let it get strong and then neglect it for a while. Um, as we're marching into, well, the middle of March, no pun intended, um, what cool season things can we get ready to uh, put outside? What are some, and you know, lettuce and spinach, but are there any other uh, cool season crops that you guys are going to be putting out soon? Broccoli, as soon as I can get my hands on some broccoli. I did not start it myself from seed, but I don't need that much. So I will go get myself a little six pack. So then... parsley is another one that you can do. Uh, if you're going to plant onion sets, you can get those out. Horseradish, asparagus, um, Brussels sprouts, uh, rhubarb. Those are all things. If you're getting the roots that or plants that you can get out as far as plants, radishes, uh, peas, I get my peas out as soon as I can work the soil. I, I do um, sprout them inside, but then I, I take them out and then I can have peas up in three days. Mm -hmm. So right. okay. one, of the, okay. one of the other things I just wanted to mention, if, if, if that gardener is wanting a new bed, it is so important that they make sure and amend the soils and get it right, test it. Before you put the plants in, you don't want to have all the plants in and find out your pH is completely wrong. And then you're trying to mend it with underneath all these plants. So it's really important that you get that bed right before you even start to plant. Okay. Um, so I did not do garlic in the fall last year, like a good girl. Um, can I do a spring planting now or whenever I can get my hands on some and have garlic for a fall harvest? Is that an option? Yes, but they'll be small. Okay. I guess that'll be my punishment for not doing it when I'm supposed to. And if you want, you can plant shallots in there too, because I, I, that's another one you can do in the fall or you should do in the fall, but you can plant shallots. They're going to be small in the fall. And uh, 
Okay. What what you might do is when you when you pick up your fall, you you harvest your fall um, garlic, you might just break a couple open and put them put them in, and you've got it planted. <laughs> for That's a really good idea. Year. And that'll kind of prompt me to, to plant it right away like I should. So, well, guys, uh, thank you so much. That was that always goes really fast. We had a great discussion. Um, and thank you so much for watching. Um, I hope you can tell that we are very eager, just as eager as you are to, uh, to get outside. And we've already got some segments that are going to be scheduled for the spring. Uh, we're going to be visiting um, Ella's neck of the woods in the next couple of weeks. She's going to teach us how to make sap. So we are ready to get out and get moving. And um, I'm ready to learn some things from these guys. So I hope you are too. Please reach out to us on our Facebook, on our Instagram, or you can always send us an email to yourgarden at gmail.com. So guys, thank you so much for coming and sharing uh, with us. And uh, we'll see you next time. And thank you so much for watching. Good night.